بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير والنفع والانتفاء والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك في كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله من مرضاته وكربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله So yesterday uh, we spoke about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم his arrival into Medina to Manawara and his uh, initial staying with Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari, where he stayed for seven months, the Prophet وسلم, and that his first concern was uh, building a masjid for the Muslim community in Medina where they can, where they can pray and worship before uh, concerning himself with building himself a house. So he stayed with Abu Ayyub al Ansari seven months. And we spoke about uh, how the Prophet وسلم, first lived downstairs and then they and then they swapped uh, with the Prophet وسلم, moving upstairs and then Abu Ayyub living downstairs at uh, Sayyidina Abu Ayyub and Ansari's request. So now we see that with the coming of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina, this is where we now have the first uh, nation, the first uh, where we have Muslims living together under uh, Islamic rule and under Muslim rule and so this was the first state that we see uh, in Islam and it was under the supervision of of its founder the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrives in Medina and his first concern is to create a community and a, uh, create a center for that community and so that first that thing that he looks to create is is the masjid and establish the masjid, and so he begins with the construction of the masjid, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then there's other things that he was concerned as well with, and uh, so one was the masjid, the building of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the second was the creation of brotherhood, of appointing for each uh, member in the community somebody who will be his brother, and literally they were considered as brothers to each other and thirdly a written uh, constitution between that which would outline for the Muslims how they should live their life and also uh, uh, how they should live and what are their relations to the other tribes the non-Muslim tribes name mainly the Jewish tribes that were in Medina and how what is their dealings with with those tribes and how they should live so this was a written constitution an agreement between all parties there in in Medina, so now we see the Prophet ﷺ when he begins the building of the masjid and he starts with it build the building of the masjid immediately from when his camel set, uh, settles when, as it arrives in Medina and chooses the spot that the masjid will be built, and the Prophet ﷺ when the camel stopped, this land belonged to Sahel and Suhail, these two young orphans. So the Prophet ﷺ asked for them to be brought. And they came with their uncle because they were still minors at this point. And so uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ uh, requests from them to buy the land. And these two boys say, no, we want we will give it uh, as sadaqah. And the uncle says, we will give it as sadaqah. And the Prophet ﷺ says, no, that rather he, will, rather that he buys the land for, for the building of the masjid. So he, the masjid, the land is bought with the money of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Because Abu Bakr was the one who came with, with this wealth and he gave the money for the building of, of the masjid for the land. And this was 10 dinar. And so on that piece of land there was a region, there was some, uh, as we said, it was a, a place where there were dry uh, dates. And also there were some graves there of, of the kuffar, of the polytheists, the old graves that were, that were uh, the, the, bod the remains were no longer there and there was no headstones and the like. And, so those bodies, the Prophet ﷺ uh, commanded for they, them to be moved and buried elsewhere. Uh, and also there was <coughs> lots of trees, palm trees on that land. And those palm trees were cut down. But he didn't just waste the, uh, the, the wood that came from those trees, the Prophet ﷺ. So we already see 1400 years ago somebody who is reusing uh, 
uh, and reciting the uh, what he had on on that site, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he used the bricks, the stones, the mud from that site itself, and he also the trees that were cut down to make the space. That he used those trees, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the wood from those trees was used from these palm trees was used as the pillars uh, inside the masjid, and the palm branches were used for the roof. Uh, for protection more from the sun rather than rain because it wasn't protection from rain uh, and then the uh, wood from the from the tree from the trees was used for the Qibla wall so the Qibla wall was made out of wood and so this wood was placed all the way along and the Qibla wall as we, we must remember that in the, in the, at that time was uh, Bayt al-Maqdis which was Masjid al-Aqsa uh, as the command hadn't been given that the Qibla was the Kaaba so that Qibla wall was made from from wood and then they used unburnt bricks uh, that were used for the walls uh, uh, on the other sides and the flooring itself so inside the masjid there was obviously there was no carpets so the, it was just sand and pebbles so soft sand was laid and the, and, and the pebbles that were around the large stones, rocks and stones were removed and so the soft sand was left and that's what, how they prayed and so th during the construction of the masjid itself the Prophet وسلم, himself got involved as we saw just as he got involved with the Kaaba the rebuilding that he was lifting stones in himself and moving the stones and putting them in place the Prophet وسلم, did the same here he was helping with uh, cutting down the trees he was helping with moving the uh, the wood with the roof moving the stones the rocks clearing the site sallallahu alayhi wasallam so he wasn't somebody who sat and just watched and commanded he actually got involved and he did it himself he led as, as an example and then everybody else followed him sallallahu alayhi wasallam and as he was uh, uh, it mentions as the sahaba were building the masjid and that they were in high spirits because now that the muhajireen who are the ones that came, left Mecca and did the Hijrah came to Medina, we call them the Muhajireen. And those who were already in Medina, lived in Medina, we call them the Ansar, the helpers, because they helped the Muhajireen. And so we see now that the Muhajireen are joyful and happy because they're no longer being oppressed. And they have freedom. And they're free to practice their religion. And so they're joyful. The, the Ansar are joyful because they've got they've this new religion, the religion of uh, Islam. And that they've left their uh, fighting that there was between the different tribes in Medina. Now they're all united. And that the Prophet وسلم, has come to them. And he's amongst them. وسلم, so they're joyful. So as they're all building and spirits are high. That they're chanting and singing praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Prophet وسلم, he gets involved. And so he chants. وسلم, Allahumma la aisha illa aish al-akhira. Faghfir lil ansar wal muhajira. Yeah, so um, he says, "Oh Lord, oh Allah, Allahumma, there is no blessing but that of the afterlife. La Aisha illa Aisha al -akhira. So forgive the Ansar and the immigrants. Yeah, so I need the Prophet sallallahu is chanting this as he's moving stones uh, with with his companions sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, as we mentioned, so the Qibla at this time was uh, Bayt al Maqdis, and so there was three doors to the masjid uh, a door one more door was at the far end another door which was called Bab Rahma uh, towards the south and then another door which was uh, with the door which the Prophet وسلم, would enter from himself uh, in the mention that its length in regards to the length of the masjid that its length from uh, the Qibla end from the Jerusalem end was 100 Dira, and the width was the same and its roof was very low that if you stood up you can you could touch the roof so it wasn't it wasn't extremely high the roof was was low and you can touch it uh, and only one side had had a roof only the northern side had a roof the southern side there was no roof and I, as I mentioned this roof was just to cover them and shade them from the sun uh, and the heat rather than uh, to protect them from the rain it wasn't waterproof and so rain did get through and so 
later when the Qibla changes then the roof was on the other side was added because now they were praying in the either, other direction so the roof was added onto the other side the south southern side so the building of the masjid took uh, two weeks as mentioned by Imam uh, Bayhaqi and once the masjid was completed the Prophet وسلم, now began the building of of his house uh, for his for his wives and at this point he was married to Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Sayyidina Sauda uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha so he built built for each of them a house adjacent to the masjid so it was right next adjacent to the masjid so that he can come to the masjid come and go as he pleases and it's he's right by the masjid and that's where his his heart was sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he can come and worship and uh, do ibadah at any time and so the houses of Sayyidina Aisha and Sayyidina Sauda were both built next to each other, next to, to the masjid. And so the masjid of the Prophet and what we have today, we see that uh, after the Prophet passed away, Sayyidina Umar made improvements to, to the masjid uh, when he was the Khalifa. Uh, and he rebuilt it of uh, unburnt bricks uh, and palm branches. And so he reinforced it and... Uh, made improvements to, to, to the building and he had its pillars uh, built out of wood and he expanded it 15 rows, rows and he added a roof so he expanded it another 15 rows back and he added a roof onto that section then when Sayyidina Uthman was a Khalifa he had the walls, the walls built out of carved stones and then this was plastered in the during the Khilafah of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then Walid ibn Abdul Malik he was the one that uh, incorporated the house of Sayyidina Aisha uh, into into the masjid and extended it in all four directions so he was when it was Walid bin Abdul Malik who uh, extended the, the masjid considerably uh, compared to what it used to be in all four directions so just quickly we'll speak about what is a masjid's role in a community and we see from the example of the Prophet وسلم, that the first thing he was concerned with was building of the masjid that this was his primary concern why because this becomes when you have a masjid and you have a center where the sahaba all of them can gather and get together and pray and meet not just pray but meet each other speak to each other, see each other and so it builds community spirit whereas if they were just left to pray in their homes no one would meet anybody else uh, nobody would be speaking to each other so there will be no uh, it will be much much more difficult to build uh, brotherhood and create brotherhood and sisterhood so the masjid was a center that was used to create these bonds amongst the, amongst the sahaba and we know the sahaba would go and sit there for hours upon end uh, praying and sometimes just sitting within the masjid sometimes just sitting waiting for the Prophet so it's a place for people to come to pray primarily but also to people to come and sit people to come and meet each other uh, masjid is much greater than uh, just the five daily prayers it's the center of any community any Muslim community and that's why our hearts should be connected to, to the masjid and when we go to the masjid and so when we see when the sahaba would come to the masjid that uh, no one was different from the other that it didn't matter if you were rich or if you were poor uh, if you were black if you were white nothing mattered you come into the masjid everybody was exactly the same so it didn't matter who you were in society whether you're richer or poorer or you were a chief or not everybody was the same in the masjid and so this was uh, a center for people to come in to come to go together and also show uh, the other communities the equality that lies within within Islam when they see all people of all different colors and uh, social standing that they were all praying together as one praying to their to their Lord uh, and also in regards to just quickly speak in regards to the Prophet وسلم, buying this land from these two boys uh, and so are we allowed to, are children allowed to trade and is it permissible for children to buy and sell? Uh, according to this hadith, the Hanafis permit it 
that you are allowed to trade, buy and sell, uh, 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 and a miner is allowed to buy and sell. Whereas in the other schools, uh, the the Shafi school they prohibit it that uh, a miner is not able to buy and sell. And this hadith, which is they say the Shafis, there isn't proof that uh, for the permissibility of it. Why? Because uh, the dealing was through the caretaker of these two young boys their uncle and so the dealing was through him and he acted in their on their behalf rather than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam doing the transaction with them and allahu alam uh, but those are the different opinions in regards to that and also then in regards to moving graves to build uh, a masjid so this you can see is is permitted to move a grave if the graves are completely obliterated uh, and there's no remains left then you are allowed to remove the grave uh, and to build a masjid on that site as long as the grave or that graveyard that site is not endowed uh, if it's been endowed then you then you can't uh, so alhamdulillah we see that the prophet sallallahu masjid was very plain and simple there was no decoration or anything around on the masajid and again this is where the scholars talk about uh, decorating our masajid extravagantly and sometimes over the top. If there's no need for it, some and there's varying opinions. Some saying that it's impermissible. Some saying majority saying it's disliked. Why? Because uh, for the person, individual praying, it will be a distraction and could, could distract them from the prayer, and they will start looking around uh, at, uh, at, the, at what's on the walls and the like. So if it if it's if it can be avoided, it should be, and nor should it be spent from the money that has been uh, that belongs that's been given for the masjid. But if somebody wanted to pay to have uh, certain verses of the Quran put up onto the onto the wall and the like, then they should do that uh, because the the money itself for the masjid, its purpose is for the upkeep of the masjid, uh, and not to. Uh, adorn the masjid rather than to make sure to keep the upkeep in terms of the masjid but uh, there's there's a leeway where the Hanafis permit uh, the adornment of the masjid to a certain extent as long as it's not over the top and depending on who's paying for it and the like so there are varying opinions in regards to that in, to, to the masjid but generally a masjid should be kept quite plain and simple and the direction which people are praying in should be plain so that when they're praying that they're not distracted by by what's on the walls so we see then uh, that the prophet sallallahu he built the masjid and once the masjid was built that they began to discuss how should they call people to to the prayer and so some mentioned uh, hitting a drum some mentioned uh, play a bell using ringing a bell uh, others mentioned using a horn but it was left undecided until one of the Sahaba, Abdullah bin Zaid, he saw in a dream where he goes to the marketplace and he goes to a seller and he asks the sell, uh, seller for a bell. And so the, the seller says to him, why why do you want this bell? What are you going to do with the bell? And he tells him what he's going to do, that we want to pray, we want to tell the people it's time for prayer. So we want, we'll play the, we'll ring the bell. And so the seller says to him, you, uh, shall I suggest to you something better than the bell? And so Abdullah bin Zayd says yes, and the seller then tells him the adhan. So Abdullah bin Zubayd, when he wakes up, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu and he tells him about this dream. And the Prophet sallallahu he says that indeed that that vision, that dream was true. So he calls Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he says to Bilal, go and give the adhan. And so Sayyidina Bilal ascends and he gives the adhan and Abdullah teaches him the adhan what to say and Bilal then says it out aloud calling the people to to prayer and when Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu they say that when he heard this and he was at his house he heard this he came running out and he came running out with so much excitement that he had almost forgot to tie his izar that he was still tying his izar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he was covered but he came running out in that state with overjoyed and excitement that he had heard uh, this he had seen this in in his dream, radiAllahu taala. And when he came out to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to tell him that this is what he also saw. So then we see that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
yeah, where he stands and he gives the Jum'ah khutbah and the like there's a, yeah, a place for him to do that and there's a stump which was placed for him to sallallahu alayhi wasallam where he would stand and give the khutbah and after a while when the the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he was standing on the stump and so this old lady came to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam she said ya rasulullah my son's a carpenter do you want if you want i will ask him to build a member uh, these steps to walk up and uh, you can as a for you to give the khutbah and so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam agreed and then they when the member was built they moved it uh, just to the side of it a few meters away and they placed it there and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam ascend and he would give the khutbah and it says that once the sahaba when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was giving the khutbah and he ascended onto the member and he began and they heard wailing and crying and they, everybody looked and it was coming from this stump and this inanimate object and that it was wailing and crying in yearning for its beloved and it's something that doesn't have a heart something that's inanimate it's not living is yearning for the beloved that's the state of this inanimate object and so the question should be asked is what is the state of our hearts that are living that are, and we are breathing and we have a soul are they yearning for muhammad yeah, are they wailing and crying for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or are these hearts silent and uh, blinded and uh, just listening and following the ego so we see that the stump the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he descends from the khutbah so he's given the khutbah and this is where people again we need to look at how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at times where he was given the khutbah he would come down such as he would come down to pick up his his grandson hussein or hassan radiyallahu ta'ala anhum if we did that today, people would go start going mad in the masjid. Why is the imam descending off the khutbah halfway through? And the Prophet ﷺ descended and he went to pick up this uh, jada, this uh, this stump. And he picked it up and he held it tight. He embraced it so it stops wailing and crying. And he says to it that if you want that you'll be a tree in this life or you can wait and we'll bury you and you'll be a tree in, in Jannah. And the tree, the stump chooses to be a tree in Jannah. And so this is a, the Prophet Sallallahu tree in Jannah. This tree will be there giving shade to the Prophet Sallallahu in Jannah. This tree that wailed and cried and yearned for him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, then uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the second thing he established when he got, arrived in, in Medina was brotherhood. Uh, that each one of the companions has a brother uh, somebody and it was literally that this person will be a brother in terms that they would inherit from each other as well and so Ja'far bin Abi Talib for example was placed with Mu'adh bin Jabal Sayyidina Hamza with Zayd bin Haritha uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was with uh, Kharija bin Zubair Abdurrahman bin Auf was with, placed with Sa'ad ibn Rabia and Abdurrahman when he arrived and he was placed as a brother with uh, Sayyidina Sa'ad he said to him that Sayyidina Sa'ad said to him that I have, you know, I have two houses that one of them is yours and I'll keep one for me and that I have uh, uh, this much wealth and that I give half of it half of it to you and that I have two wives that if you want, if you're not married I'll divorce one and you can marry the other if, if she's happy and if you're happy and so Abdurrahman says like you know, relax, don't worry uh, Alhamdulillah you know, I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm a tradesman, I'm a, I'm a businessman just show me where is the marketplace and I will survive uh, anhum. so we see that the Prophet وسلم, created this brotherhood amongst his companions as he knew وسلم, this is from his wisdom that it was important that they have somebody that they can each rely upon somebody that they can go back to, connect to uh, and who will support each other And this again is a lesson for us that brotherhood isn't just ties of blood but also of your Islam that it's important that we have people and we are brothers and sisters to each other and that we are uh, we are trustworthy and we uh, people can rely upon us and so we see the Prophet ﷺ, literally they were inheriting from each other until the verses came down to abrogate this that uh, where Allah says that but those blood uh, but those of blood relationship are more entitled to inheritance in the decree of Allah so this abrogated that practice. The third thing that the Prophet وسلم, uh, established was the constitution, this, which was a written constitution between the Ansar and the Muhajireen. And this was a 
peace treaty with the Jews. So one was a, a agreement between the Muhajireen and the Ansar that they were brothers and sisters and they live together and help each other. And also a peace agreement with the Jews that this is how the, they will live with, with the other Jewish tribes living in Medina. And this uh, agreement, this constitution recognized their rights, the Jewish tribes to their wealth, that their wealth was their wealth and their religion is their religion and their rights are their rights. That nobody can go and transgress uh, the other the other religions, the other people who are not or, or not Muslim, nobody can go and transgress their rights. Because the Prophet ﷺ had seen that in Mecca how the rights of the Muslims were transgressed. And so uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not an oppressor. And so he established rights for everybody and the, according to, to our religion. So some of the things that this constitution mentioned was that the Ansar and the Muhajireen are one nation. That regardless of tribe, uh, etc., they all are equal and they have to pertain to rights of others. Uh, that those committed to Allah will stand up to injustice. So any type of injustice that was seen, that anybody sees that, that they stand up to that. And this is where, uh, from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that if somebody sees a munkar, uh, if something evil or bad, that he changes it immediately if he's able to. If he's not, then he does some, says something. He changes it with his tongue and if he's not able to do that then he at least has some hatred towards it in his heart that he doesn't like this act and he said that that's the lowest form of iman so some of the other things that mentioned that they won't fight amongst themselves that there'll be no fighting amongst the muhajireen or with the ansar or vice versa or amongst themselves as well muhajireen muhajireen ansar with ansar and when we say muhajireen ansar this is just how we name them it doesn't mean they were two separate groups or tribes that they all lived together as one. They're all Madani and lived in Medina as one. And people of the Prophet wasallam. So that they will all abide by peace treaties of the state. That the, all the peace treaties that the Muslims had. And the Prophet wasallam would make and have. That they would all abide by that. Nobody would break uh, any one of those peace agreements. That the Muslims were protectors of one another. And that the Jewish tribes and those tribes who were not Muslim. That the, which was the Jewish tribes in Medina that they had right to their own religion uh, and if any Jew commits a crime uh, or anybody who's not uh, anybody commits a crime that only that individual is is punished uh, and vice versa the Jews must commit and these tribes must commit uh, to support uh, each other and also to support uh, the Muslims that if the Muslims were to go to war against somebody then the, the Jewish tribes would support them and vice versa if the Jewish tribes were to go to war uh, or if somebody was to go to war against them that the Muslims would go with them and defend them so these were some of the agreements that were made uh, and some of the things within that agreement and that constitution of the Prophet so we'll finish there inshallah and tomorrow we will look at the family of the Prophet sallam's arrival into Medina and we will speak a little about be an opportunity to speak about the family of the Prophet وسلم, from his wives and from his children. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ya Rabbana atarafna bi anna naqtarafna wa anna asrafna ala la da ashrafna fatawba layna tawba taqsilu kulli hawba wa astunna al-arati wa amiru ati wa kulli walidina rabbi wa mawlidina wa ahli wa likhwani wa sa'iri al-khillani wa kulla di mahabba awjiratan wa sahba wa al-muslimin ajma' amin rabbi isma' فضلا وجود من نالا باكتساب منا بالمصطفى رسولي نهضا بكل سولي بالمصطفى رسولي نهضا بكل سولي وصلى وسلم ربي عليه عدى الهم وآله وصحبه إدادة تشي صحبه والحمد لله في البدء والتناهي سبحان ربي كرم بالعزة يما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين في كل لحظة نبدا عدد خلق ورضا نفسه وزنة أرش ومداد كلمات اللهم سلم وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الفاتحة